Well, happy Independence Day as we're celebrating the 245th anniversary of our nation's declaration of independence. On July 4, 1776, 56 delegates at the Second Continental Congress drafted and signed a bill declaring our independence from the kingdom of Great Britain. A lot of wars have been waged since then. There's been a lot of battles that have been fought, a lot of lives that have been sacrificed, and I'm thankful for this country. I'm thankful for God's blessing on it, for the men and women who have given so much to make it a reality. And today, we're starting a new series called Hidden Gems, where we're looking at some sections of scripture that sometimes can be overshadowed, they can be overlooked. You know, we can, you know, elevate some stories over the others, but all of them are incredible to see just how God worked through his people. Today, we're going to be looking at a story that it's kind of overshadowed by the more well-known David versus Goliath story. Everybody knows David versus Goliath, right? You don't even have to be a Christian. You don't have to be religious. You can find people just in culture who have heard this theme of David versus Goliath. You know, how the the underdog, the, the unlikely is able to triumph in this impossible situation. But there's a story that I think is just as incredible that, that lies in the shadow of that story in 1 Samuel 17. Just a few chapters before in 1 Samuel chapter 14, we see the story of Jonathan stepping out in faith. It's one of my favorite stories as we see Jonathan, King Saul's son, just step out and go into total dependence on God. And so since this is July 4th, our Independence Day, but in this story we see Jonathan relying totally on God for his future, I'm calling this message a declaration of dependence. That, that we all need in our lives, we need a declaration of dependence on God. That it's not about us being strong enough, us being creative enough, us just trying hard enough. No, this is about us living lives like Jonathan, surrendered and totally dependent on God. He shows that here. He shows that he's dependent on God to guide him. He's dependent on God to deliver him. He is dependent on God for his personal future and for the future of the nation of Israel. And I think that many of us, in many different ways, on this Independence Day, we need a declaration of dependence on God in every area of our life. So with that in mind, let's look at 1 Samuel chapter 14. And just to get you caught up, if you're not there yet, Israel is in a very difficult position here. Saul is ruling and reigning as king. God didn't want them to have a king. They cried out, they complained, they murmured, we want a king, we want to be like all the other nations. And so God said, okay, fine, you want a king, here's a king. Saul is placed in that position. He he was one that if you looked at him, he looked the part. Saul was head and shoulders above everyone else in Israel. He was big, strong. He, He should have been a great leader, and yet he wasn't. In the chapter before this, in chapter 13, he's gone against God and what God had told him to do, and in that, he, it's cost him the future of his throne. Not just for him, but for future generations. So this is actually the beginning of the end for Saul's reign as king. In just a few chapters, we'll see this shepherd boy named David come on the scene, who God is moving into that position. But in the meantime, Saul's still the king, but he isn't leading. As we're gonna see in this chapter, he's actually sitting He's watching, he's waiting, he's just hanging out. He's, he's surrounded by the Philistine army. He's outnumbered, he's outmatched, and he's just sitting there. But Jonathan, his son, isn't. He's not willing to just sit back and wait. He's not willing to just sit there when he knows we serve the one true God. We may be outnumbered, they may have a better position, they have, may have better weapons, but we have the one true God on our side. And so I'm not sitting back. I'm stepping out. And that's what we see take place here. Let's pick it up. 1 Samuel chapter 14, verse 1. One day, Jonathan. I love this. We, we celebrate specific days of great battles, right? We're talking about July 4th, 1776. There's other great days in history where we know this was the day, this was the month, this was the year. But here, it's just one day. 
One day that was like every other day where one man who was normal and just like anybody else decided to step out in faith and God did the impossible. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. You see, Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. And the people who were with him were about 600 men. Skip down to verse six. But Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. He's saying, look, they they don't have the covenant symbol that we have with the one true God. We have his protection. We have his power. They don't, and let us not forget that. And it may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I'm with you, heart and soul. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this time to worship, Lord. Lord, the time to come before you and to to sing praises. Lord, to have our hearts and our minds fixed on you. For who you are, for what you've done. Lord, I pray for the, the different places that these lives and hearts and minds are in today. Or we may feel like we're in the fire, where we may feel like we're in the waters, where we may feel like we're entering into a battle. God, may we be reminded that you are with us. May we trust in your strength, your power alone, and know that you can provide the victory. Nothing can hinder you from saving by many or by few. Or be with us, be our teacher, and change us to be more like your son in this time. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, what is this declaration of dependence? What does Jonathan do? What what, what do we see take place here? Well, the first thing I believe we see that it starts with is the audacity to move forward in faith. The declaration of dependence, saying, hey, God, I'm trusting you completely, starts when he takes this first step. Everybody else is hanging out in the caves, Everyone else is cowering in fear. Everyone else is is safely on the sidelines. And he says, this is not what God has for us. This is not where he wants his people to be, cowering in fear and running from the enemy. And so he starts by taking a step of audacious faith. It's him and his armor bearer. He says to his armor bearer, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison in verse 1 and in verse 6. He said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. Now, if you go back and you read chapter 13, you'll see just how audacious and and full of faith this step was because there in that chapter, it says that the Philistines had 30,000 chariots. 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore. That's what they're surrounded by. Tens of thousands of chariots, possibly hundreds of thousands of soldiers. It was, they could just compare it to the sand on the seashore. And here, Jonathan and his armor bearer go. Just two men with a couple swords going against this entire army before him. This is completely audacious faith. But that's the case many times when God calls us to do something. That so many times when God calls us to step out in our lives with our families as a church, what he's calling us to is total dependence on him. Because so many times these steps of faith moving forward, they don't make sense to those around us. If he would have went to Saul and the others, they would have laughed at him. No, we're not going. It's 600 of us. There's tens of thousands of them. They have an elevated position. They have us outflanked. They have us outnumbered. They have all of the advantage. This doesn't work. And yet he moves forward in faith anyway. Have you ever been there before? Personally, as a family, have we been there before as a church where where God tells us different things to do and maybe everybody and their brother around you says, don't do that. That doesn't make sense, and all you know is what God said, and you're trusting to take a step of audacious faith. It it makes me think of the life of J.W. Tucker. I've never heard of him before, but he lived this. 
he took steps of audacious faith. In the 1960s, he felt called by God to go to the Congo in Africa. It was during a time when they were in the middle of a civil war. Everyone around him said, don't go into this place right now. Don't go into this war-torn country. It's not safe. Don't follow. One friend even told him, if you go, you won't come out. To which Tucker responded, God didn't tell me I had to come out. He only told me I had to go in. That's audacious faith. To say, yeah, he didn't tell me that part. All I know is he told me this part, and he said to move forward in faith. Well, the friend's prophecy came true. Tucker never came out. You see, he was murdered by the tribe that he was attempting to reach. They beat him to death. They threw him in the river right beside, and he was eaten by crocodiles. You say, Skip, that's not the best sales pitch when you're trying to get a step out in faith, right? (laughs) Might want to pick a different story. But you see, success for him was defined by submission to God's plan for his life. Success for him was just being completely obedient to what God had told him to do. And God told me to go in and to try to reach these people with the gospel. And to us, we think that was a failure, right? You didn't accomplish the goal. Oh, he accomplished the goal. He was perfectly submitted and obedient to move forward in faith to what God had called him to do. And just like last week, we don't need to press pause in the story right there. Because the story wasn't over. God was still working. God was still using his life. Because you see, before he died, he had led a police officer to Christ in that country. And decades later, this police officer goes to this same tribe for a call. But as he's going, he, he remembered Tucker. He remembered this tribe. And he remembered an ancient tribal tradition that they had. That said, if the blood of any man flows in the Bomokandi River, you must listen to his message. And so here this police officer comes knowing that his blood had flowed in that river. And he said to the tribal leaders, he said, some time ago a man was killed. His body was thrown into your river. The crocodiles ate him. His blood flowed there. But before he died, he left me with a message This message concerns God's son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into the world to save people who were sinners. He died for the sins of the world. He died for my sins. I received this message and it changed my life. And in that moment, people and members and leaders of the tribe began to fall on their faces and repent of their sins and give their lives to Christ. Today, thousands of people in that area are believers because Tucker said, All I know is God told me to go in, and I'm going to be faithful to that. But what has God called you to step into? That maybe he didn't say you're coming out, but he said, I want you just to trust me enough to move in. Tucker did. Jonathan did. He didn't know if he was coming out of this. He just knew I'm not sitting in the cave, and God wants us to move forward. Do we live lives like that? to step out in audacious faith. And and how about this real quick before we move on? What about a hidden gem within this hidden gem? What about this armor bearer? Do we live lives like this armor bearer or are we more like J.W. Tucker's friends who tried everything they could to talk him out of going forward? No, don't do that. You're crazy, That's, that's outrageous. Or do we look at the people around us and see the callings and the the movement of God in their lives and say, I'm with you heart and soul. To, to help them move forward in faith. In the Hebrew, the ar- armor bearer's response is more literally, I'm with you like your heart is with you. Think about that. How many times have you ever had to tell your heart to keep up? It's there, it's beating, it's on time, it's faithful, you don't have to think about it. If you ever do, you're in trouble, right? Because something's really wrong. He's saying, I'm with you, like your heart's beating in your chest. You go and do everything that God has called you to do, and I am with you, brother, heart and soul. And with that, they had the audacity to move forward in faith, which leads to number two. And that's the reason they were willing to do this. The reason they were willing to move forward in faith is because they had the certainty that the Lord isn't limited in what he can do. 
Jonathan had a certainty in his heart, in his mind, that he believed to his core that God was not limited in what he could do. Look at verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of the uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving. Nothing can stop him whether it's by many or by few. God is not limited in what he can do. Now notice I said can do, not will do. Jonathan didn't say with 100% certainty, we're going over here and the Lord will act on our behalf. He said he may. I don't know, but I'm just stepping out in faith and I'm trusting and I'm believing and I'm knowing that he can. It makes me think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they're standing there and they're being told to bow down and the the furnace is right in front of them and it's been heated seven times its limit. And what do they say? Our God can save us from this, but even if he doesn't. I know he can. And even if he doesn't, we're still not gonna bow down and worship you. How about the story of Esther? this amazing story of how God positions this young Jewish girl to become a Persian queen through a beauty contest in order to save his people. An incredible story of just God weaving and working the story. And and many people have heard a famous verse from that in chapter 4, verse 14, where Mordecai is saying, you know, you were placed here for such a time as this. We talk about that, right? For such a time as this, for, for this time and for this season, you were perfectly positioned for this. And yet so many times we leave out how Mordecai frames that phrase because the opening words in that verse are, and who knows? Who knows? Maybe you were put here for such a time as this. Maybe he kills you, I don't know. But we're gonna step forward in faith knowing that he can, knowing that he can use this. (laughs) That's Jonathan's word here. It may be, perhaps, It's possible. But what he ends with is, I'm certain that he can. I don't know if he will, but I'm certain that he can. And I'm moving forward in faith, even against all odds. How many of you have ever seen the movie or or read the books for the Hunger Games? Any Hunger Games fans? Maybe you were an extra in it as it was filmed just a mile or so away from here. But in that movie, if you've never seen it, the The tagline for the movie is, may the odds be ever in your favor. May the odds be ever in your favor. And and that may be a good tagline for a movie, but that couldn't be further from the truth of living a Christian life. Can you think of any story in all of scripture where the odds were ever in their favor? That, that, That is the complete opposite of the story of Scripture. The odds are always against us when God is calling us to move. I love how Mark Batterson responded to that tagline. In his book, Chase the Lion, he said this. He said, that isn't how it works in the kingdom of God. It's more like, may the odds be ever against you. Impossible odds set the stage for God's greatest miracles. And apparently God loves long shots. Isn't that why you removed 9,700 soldiers from Gideon's army? Isn't that why he let the fiery furnace be heated seven times hotter? Isn't that why he didn't show up until Lazarus was four days dead? Why? To ensure that he gets all the credit. He gets all the glory. When's the last time you attempted something that was destined to fail without divine intervention? That's the story of faith over and over in Scripture. Abraham's 100, his wife's 90. You don't start a great nation at that point, right? Like that ship has sailed. We're not having any kids, God. Oh, yeah, you are if I tell you to. There's nothing that can hinder me from starting this nation out of you two. When you have 5,000 fathers, including their families, we're probably thinking 20, 25, 30,000 people. You don't feed them with a couple loaves and a few fish. When you put it in God's hand, you can. The sun doesn't stand still. Seas don't part. Little boys don't beat giants. But as the angel told Mary in Luke chapter 137, nothing is impossible with God. There's no limits to what he can do. 
So I don't know what it is in your life. In mine, it was odds are I can't preach in and of myself, but, but God certainly can. Maybe it's God, you think, I, I can't fix this marriage. And you're right, but God can uh, we're not going to make it financially, probably not on your own, but with God, you certainly can. Odds are you can't fill in the blank, but God certainly can. Because how about this? 2,000 years ago, Friday, dead. The tomb's sealed. It's over. Disciples are scattering. Sunday, alive. That's the God we serve. That's the God we believe in. That's the God that Jonathan knew as well and that he followed in audacious faith because he had the certainty that God was not limited in what he could do. And through this declaration of dependence, number three, we see the victory that was only possible by the power of God. We see victory. They won, but it wasn't because of Jonathan and his armor bearer's abilities. It wasn't because they could do things that no one else could do. This was all about God. If you look at verses 8 through 15, you see it play out. You see that they make the craziest plan ever. He says, all right, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go out. We're going to make ourselves known. We're not even going to use the element of surprise. We're going to yell at them. And if they say it this way, then we'll know that God's given us into their hands. If they respond this way, we'll know we're in trouble. They go out and make themselves known. They tell him to come up here. We're going to show you something. And he looks at the armor bearer and he says, God's delivered us. God's going to provide the victory. And here these two men come into this camp and God begins to wreak havoc. God begins to, to, to set fear into the Philistines. He brings an earthquake to shake the ground. And over and over we see that God has come through. The summary statement is in verse 23. Look there. The whole thing summarized. And so the Lord saved Israel that day. It doesn't say, and Jonathan saved Israel that day. Jonathan was the star. No, God is the star. God's the one who saved. This may be a story that has Jonathan as a part of it. But this is not a story about Jonathan. It's about God and how he saves his people, how he comes through the way only he can. In verses six, in verse 10, in verse 12, in verse 23, Jonathan knows this. He says, it may be that the Lord will move on our behalf. The Lord has given them into our heads. The Lord is working. The Lord saved Israel that day. It says in verse 15 that the earth quaked you think Jonathan and his armor bearer are causing the earth to quake? You think they're mighty enough, they're strong enough? No. This is God moving on their behalf, doing the supernatural, doing what only he can do when they stepped out in faith. Alistair Begg points this out. He says, time and again in the Bible, when we hear of the earth quaking, it's a signaling indication that God himself is administrating and overruling and intervening in things. Think about it, the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Think of the time with the Philippian jailer. It's a reminder, you see, that God is not a bystander in your life. He wasn't a bystander then, he's not a bystander now. So yes, we can, we can learn from Jonathan. We can live differently, but ultimately this is about looking to Jesus because he's the only one who can provide the victory. It's his one commentary I read said this. It said, God really used Jonathan, yes, but it wasn't Jonathan's victory. It was the Lord's victory. God was just waiting for someone with the bold trust of Jonathan. The same thing's true today. And he wants to provide the victory that he wants to move the way only he can. He's looking around and looking for some boldness of some Jonathans to say, okay, I'll step out in audacious faith. I'm not sitting in the cave anymore. I'm not cowering in fear. I'm not running from the enemy. I don't care if I'm outnumbered. This is what God said to do, and this is what we're going to do. Psalm 3, 8, salvation or victory belongs to who? The Lord. 
Psalm 33, 16. The king is not saved by his great armies. The warrior's not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is made ready for the day of battle. We prepare. We plan. We do what we can do. But the victory belongs to the Lord. He's the only one. With your head's bowed and your eyes closed. You and God. I know there's battles raging in this room. There are steps of faith that have you just frozen in fear. Where you look at the numbers, you look at it on paper, you look at it logically, you look at the way everyone else does it, and it goes, this doesn't make sense. This can't happen. And yet God keeps saying, nope, that's what I want. Move in when everybody else is telling you to move out. Take the step, even when it looks like it's off the cliff. And just trust me to do what only I can do. I can't think of a better declaration of dependence in our lives than for us today to believe and to declare to God in all of our lives, I don't know the way, but you do. I don't have the strength but you do. And I can't win the battle, but you can. To step out in audacious faith, to have the certainty, the confidence that he's not limited in what he can do. And know that we're gonna see the victory. You've probably never heard of the name Eugene Bartlett. He was a well-known singer, music minister, hymn writer a hundred years ago. He had a great life. He had a beautiful wife. He had two kids. Things were great in his life and ministry. And then at 53, everything changed. Had a debilitating stroke. Left him unable to walk, unable to speak. He was bedridden for most of his life. But in the middle of that darkness, in the middle of that pain, he began to think back over his life began to think about how good God had been to him and how even in the middle of this that God was with him and he was going to use it somehow for his glory. And an audacious faith and with certainty that God wasn't limited to what he could do, this broken man sat down and began to write the words that we're about to sing about the victory that we have in Jesus. Let this be our declaration of dependence. Let this be the cry of our hearts, the focus of our mind, the only place we look for victory. No matter where we are, no matter what we need, to have the audacity to step out in faith because of the certainty that our God can provide the victory. Father, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, give the victory in Jesus' name.